Well, welcome everyone to another crisis conversation live from the Better Life Lab. Today, we're going to be talking about childcare and particularly childcare in this time of the corona crisis. And I think before we get started, we've got a wonderful group of people to, to share their stories, a childcare provider, an early care educator, uh, a reporter who can give us a, a 30,000 foot view about what is and isn't working. Um, uh, Catherine from the National Women's Law Center, who's done a lot of really good research about how to move forward. I think I want to start off with saying this is already a pretty broken system, uh, our child care system in the United States. You know, our early care educators are caregivers, they earn poverty wages. Uh, parents are uh, shouldering the bulk of the cost of child care. Um, the government pays about 40% of the, of the cost of child care, parents 60%, and philanthropy about, you know, and business about 1% to 4%. So more than anything, this crisis is showing how broken the system is. And here we're in a position where a number of governors are saying it's time to go back to work. Um, and, and yet nobody is really addressing child care or addressing it effectively. So I want to talk about that. Um, about what we're, what the experience is now and what we're learning and what we need to change moving forward. So let me first start with Patricia Moran. You are, um, you're a family care provider um, out in California. Uh, and when we were talking before, you usually have about 14 children. And when the crisis hit, a number of par parents then pulled out or they, you know, they had to shelter in place and stay home. But you stayed open because you had some essential workers who really needed your help. So tell us your story. What's what's been happening since the pandemic hit, and how is that affecting your 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 business? Yes. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Patricia Moran, and thank you for this opportunity. Because, um, really, this um, COVID nineteen pandemic um, has revealed just how in this in indispensable our child care are to our communities providing direct service to frontline workers. Um, um, my child care is open. I have before 14 children and now I have only three. And you know, and before, you know, before this crisis, we were facing a lot of situations that providers, you know, with uh, not any benefits, the, the they pay is really low to us. We, we didn't have any, any protection, any support as the correct word. Yeah. And now with this crisis, imagine how hard it is for a provider because we have to, you know, uh, we are working very close with parents, with the community. We are seeing their necessities, the parents, single mom, the children, and at the same time, we were like uh, trying to find the cleaning supplies, mm. the food for these kids and yeah. this crisis. And we are, you know, um, working with the healthy um, health departments and our state governments to keep our children safe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like, this crisis, like I say, I told you before, is a, a wake-up call for everybody because, especially for the child care providers, that's why we are, uh, before this crisis, we start getting together to have our union, to, have, to raise up our, our profession, to raise up our voice. Right. about these situations, because we were seeing how um, we didn't have that support. And now with this crisis, it's completely, it's terrible. Because, you know, you know uh -huh. is, so you said that you stayed open for three children instead of 14. You know, can you talk a little bit more about why? Who were the, who were the parents and, you know, why did you stay open? And then what is that like? You've got, you know, uh, governors who'll say, oh, we'll just keep our, we'll just make sure that children stay six feet apart. Well, how can you keep toddlers six feet apart? How are you, talk about how, like, who are the parents that you needed to stay open for? And, and how are you, how are you managing the children in a, in, in a pandemic? I mean, you know, um, well, like I said, 14 children, but most of those parents, they were essential workers. The three children I had, 
the parents, they are the essential workers. And my, oh, and my daycare is completely open for all the essential workers, but for the system, you know, we are trying to get those mm, children. But um, right now we are using, you know, um, through the union, we have that platform. We create a platform, the Karina platform, to get to, to reach those essential workers. Because like me, myself, is, you know, I have an infant and I have a toddler and a preschooler. And like you say, it's really, really hard. It's really hard to maintain to the guidelines for this crisis, like a social distance. We need to clean. We, we were cleaning before a lot of times our child daycares for the quality uh, to care our children. But now uh, we need to do you know, more often, more. And, and we don't have that, the access to those supplies. We are working, uh, we are calling to the, the um, retail, major retailers to get access to those cleaning supplies. But, you know, it's, in the meantime, we need to, uh, we are organizing ourselves with, you know, uh, through phone to right. digital platforms, to direct action to support each other, and, you know, sharing supplies, you know, right. trying to find who has the supplies, who has the other one. In the social distance, like with an infant, how are you going to have a social distance with oh, an infant? Yeah. How are you going to do that with an infant? To, you know, to change the diaper. You can't stop a toddler and say, don't hug me. Don't give me a kiss. It's it's hard. It's right. And you know we are working day by day, and this this um, the childcare system is completely. We need to do something. That's why the union, the CCPU, childcare providers in California, right. we are going to um, very soon be able to both to have our union officially okay. recognized. So, Patricia, I want to come, Patricia, I want to come back to the, you know, to, to the provider side of the story and talk about, um, you know, uh, if you tried to get one of the small business loans that was supposed to be part of the bailout and, and we'll talk more about the union efforts, but let me move over to Rashonda now. Rashonda, you are an early care educator uh, in upstate New York. Um, you've worked in the early care and caregiving field for what nine years. Um, you know your children love you. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, work at the uh, YWCA. But when we've been talking, you talked about how how what a challenge it is. You know that in New York State you do have more of a living wage, but in many places caregivers earn you know on average about ten dollars an hour, which is just it's not livable. And what's it been like for you through this crisis? Have you been able to continue working? Um, how, you know, has there been turnover or, you know, are people, you know, kind of what is your experience through this crisis and uh, turn it over to you? Um, well, my daycare center closed down on March 18th. Um, we had our boss give us different options. So I decided to continue to work um, in the classroom. So I usually was like cleaning, um, prepping for when we do open back up. Um, I was bringing home the same amount I usually make, but as time went on, it got more, the crisis got more serious. Um, I decided to stay home and work at home. So I was uh, helping my boss with like um, PowerPoints and giving her feedback. And at that time I wasn't working a lot. So my paycheck wasn't a lot, so I also had to use my PTO, which in, I didn't want to, but I had no choice. Yeah. Um, after that, I started feeling a little overwhelmed because we have to do trainings now. Um, it's a 15-hour training a week, and you have to also reach out to parents, uh, do Zoom or Facebook. So on top of me going to school and that also switched over where my curriculum was changed and then I have to teach my daughter. Right. So, you, how old is your daughter, Rashonda? She's five. And so she's out of, she's out of school too. So you're trying to do this and do your own child care at the same yeah. time. So just the other day, I actually like turned my phone off because I was overwhelmed with emails and I'm like, I'm slacking on my schoolwork because I'm not that focused. Cause I'm like, I have to do this. I have to do that. Um, I got a little frustrated, irritated, 
Um, so I decided just to disconnect myself from like the world. Um, so my daycare center is opening up May 18th for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't heard back from my daughter's school saying if they're going to open up or not. So I also have to figure out what am I going to do when she does, when we do open up, where am I going to put my daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, let me turn over to Lillian right now. Lillian Monjo, she is an editor and writer at the Heckinger Report. And you wrote a really powerful piece about how this pandemic is, is about to shatter what you call an already fragile childcare system. So can, you know, you've heard Patricia, um, you know, she's, she's down to three kids, you know, struggling to make ends meet. Rashonda, you know, same thing with a, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get through the crisis uh, and then go back to a situation that's also, you know, less than ideal. What can you tell us about the overall system, how it's working and what the pandemic is showing us about whether, uh, you know, <laughs> just how fragile it is? Well, I think first, I mean, in the headline to that piece, we had system in quotation marks, because the truth is there is no system, really. There is no child care system in the United States. There is a patchwork of different things, different parts of this, of, don't even interact. I mean, there's like, there's like Head Start funding that comes from the federal government, that's for children living in poverty. There's um, CCDBG, which is an acronym for a program that provides child care subsidies for low-income parents. Together, those two programs reach one in six of the families that are eligible to receive them. Wow. So that means that everyone who's actually eligible, it's one in six. And then there's millions more families who can't really afford care. Um, on top of that, the reimbursement rates that are paid to providers are too low to expect quality. So you've got that, and then you've got all the private care, which is the majority of the market. Um, parents struggle to afford that care, and even paying, even even with parents paying the same amount as state college tuition, providers are often unable to meet all the requirements in terms of space and health and safety and, and all the quality requirements and pay their um, workers more than a living wage, as you've been talking about. 53% of child care workers um, access government benefits themselves because the wages are so close to the poverty level. Wow. Thank so you. it's really just, it's not, it's not a system. That's the answer. That's why it's fragile. There's no, there's no one mechanism, even like with K-12, it's not like the federal government can say one thing and all K-12 schools do it, but at least the state has that kind of network. And that's not true in early childhood. So, you know, one of the questions is when you look at other advanced economies, um, you know, they don't have this, the same kind of patchwork system. They have, um, you know, a, a, a much more um, a sense that this is a, a public good. It's almost treated like education, you know, a recognition that this is not a market that works. This is not a free market. Um, why is it that, you know, why are we where we are in the United States and what will it take to change that? Um, it's a good point. I think a lot of um, American parents don't realize that if they lived in any other developed country that basically by the time their child was three, at least they would have guaranteed public care. Um, and, and in a lot of places that that's age two. There's also paid parental leave most places of up six months to a year, which gets you a little further down the road before you need to start paying for care. So there's, there's just like a whole bunch of supports that don't exist in the United States. Why that is, I mean, ultimately, if you look at the history of the attempts to create um, broader care programs, there's just a feeling in the United States or there has been overall that this is a personal problem. This is a problem for each family to figure out on their own. Children belong to their parents, not the government. That's kind of the attitude. And so repeatedly, um, we've had chances. There was a universal system in place during World War II that was taken back when the men came home from war with the idea that women should now be returning home. Right. Um, there was, a, in the 1972, there was a bipartisan bill that went to Richard Nixon's desk that would have established universal child care for everybody, and that was vetoed. Um, on top of all that, there's the racial dynamic where um, poor women and women of color have typically been expected to work, and most of the benefit programs that are supposed to get child care in are aimed at people that are expected to work, which is that group, you know, unfairly, and that's, that's a old racist policy, but that's how it's been. And then policies aimed at the, the middle class have assumed, oh, you're probably like a middle class white woman who's choosing to work and you don't need to go to the office. So it would be better if you were home with your kids. So there's this, mm -hmm. there's this like, and it separates the people who need the care into these two different competing groups when really they all are wanting the same thing. Right. Um, so there's a lot of just um, 
precedent in the United States for the way we think about who provides care and who needs it. And that has influenced how our policies have um, evolved. So let me go back to Patricia at this point, you know, um, so thank you so much for that, Lillian. Thank you for all of you for sharing your stories. And as Angela mentioned, we do have the chat open um, and, you know, really want to hear other people's perspectives and points of view, because as Lillian said, part of part of why we are in this, this situation where we have a system in quotation marks, it's really broken, are these assumptions about uh, who should do what in society. And if policymakers think that, well, it's better if certain women are home and other women are just expected to work, you know, that, that, that's not the reality that most people are experiencing. The majority of children in this country are being raised in families where all available parents are working. So if that's our, you know, if that's what the reality is, why do we not have a system that matches that? So Patricia, let's go back to you. You know, uh, we've heard about a lot of these government bailouts and Boeing is going to get, you know, millions and millions of dollars and yet childcare providers who are, like you say, essential workers yourselves, uh, have gotten very little. Um, what was your own experience? Have you tried to get some, uh, you know, some government money that was designed for small businesses? And how has that gone? You know, my experience that I applied, I applied for the SBA, for the check protection loan in the first round, and the money was gone. I couldn't get anything. Wow. You know, and it's a, it's a small business. It's a small business that is supposed to, you know, help us. And the, the only, you know, email I, you know, I, the answer was, yeah, I'm sorry, but the funds were completely quickly go, gone. So, so how, you know, in the past few years, the number of family providers has really dropped, you know, and family mm -hmm. providers really do help uh, workers who are hourly workers or who have, um, you know, unpredictable schedules or work, uh, you know, uh, alternative hours, you know, are really the backbone for a lot of who are now uh, essential workers. You know, you were saying, so if you've only got three children coming in, you know, how are you able to pay your bills? And, you know, how are you able to pay, you know, do you still have your staff? And are you worried about being able to stay open yourself? Yes, yes, um, we are. Um... That's one of, one of the, the comments, you know, we had with other providers, you know, the communication is that what is gonna happen with our, you know, our cares. Some providers, they are deciding to close permanent the, the childcare business. Some like me, I have the hope, you know, something is gonna change. And uh, the, the thing we are doing now, we are getting help a little help, but for the subsidy children, but I let you put in context that providers, we have subsidy children and private children too. And the private children, they are right now, they're completely, you know, they are, they are not bringing the kids, they are not paying because we didn't have this situation in our contract, you know? Right. It's, it's, right. it's a crisis, it's a crisis because if we have better training to do this, all this, you know, is gonna be different. That's why it's how important to change this, to not change, but at, at least have a voice yeah. to hear us. Like child, pro child providers, we know our necessities. Right. We know, you know, and the parents too, because we have the communications. Right. And what my staff, I reduced my staff. Before I told you I had my two assistants, now I have one only part time because right. I can't afford it. I can't afford to pay them. Right. And that's why it's just so important, you know, we are getting together to try to do something. To do something and I it. have the hope. Well, so you talk about you had to let one of your caregivers go. So Rashonda, can we come back to you? Because one of the things that really struck me when you and I were talking is, you know, you, you talked about going to school and you've gone back to school to get more education. Um, you know, there are a number of requirements now that, um, you know, early care educators have uh, bachelor's degrees or get more, um, get more education. But then you're stuck holding student loans and you were saying kind of like looking at this crisis and looking at how much you might be able to earn as an early care educator, which isn't much, 
that you're actually now thinking, even as even though you love it, you're thinking about changing professions. Can you can you talk about that sort of like the future that you see for caregivers and early care teachers? Um, I decided to change um, career paths because of financially. Um, I'll be able to provide for my daughter more, um, have health benefits because I don't have that right now. Um, I don't really know what it's going to look like for care um, takers and providers. Um, I just know that I just want more for myself and my daughter. Yeah. To provide for her because I, you know, she's what's really important to me. Right. Well, you know, we're getting some questions from the chat and thank you for that. Um, so let me turn it over to Catherine White at this point. Some of the questions are about like, well, what do we do? Um, you know, what do we do at the state level? What do we do at the federal level? What are some of the answers? And Catherine, you're with the National Women's Law Center and you've been part of this big new report that's come out really looking at this. Um, so tell me, tell us what you, what you and, uh, and your colleagues have found. So yeah, thank you. And first of all, I just want to say thank you to Patricia and Rashonda for sharing your stories. I, you know, I think they really just show how this system of sorts is at its breaking point. And the situation is just untenable for parents, for educators, for providers. And, you know, for decades, for centuries, we've been asking women to do this kind of essential work without the compensation and supports to do so. Um, and I think what's really crucial and that we show in our analysis is how this is a sector-wide problem. And I think Patricia, you mentioned this as well. It's not just about subsidy families and it's not just about private paying families. This is affecting the whole market. And so what we really need is federal investment that gets dollars to states and then to families and providers to cover all of the ongoing operational costs that providers have, um, including premium pay for providers like Patricia that are open and serving children of essential workers, and that makes sure that educators like Rashonda continue to get paid, have access to paid sick leave and other benefits, and that parents who rely on both of you for the essential work that you provide don't have to pay anything out of pocket. For too long, we've squeezed providers and educators and parents instead of providing the public funding that we know the child care system needs. So our analysis which we did with our partners at the Center for Law and Social Policy and a labor economist from the University of Minnesota show that if we just want to keep our child care system afloat during this crisis, we just want to make ends meet right now, the system needs at least $9.6 billion a month in federal funding to do so. Wow, wow. $9.6 billion a month just for the crisis. Yes. And then beyond that, we know that we cannot just rebuild to what we had before because as Lillian mentioned, this system system was not working. So policymakers have an opportunity to reimagine what our system actually looks like so that providers have a living wage, uh, educators can make ends meet, and parents aren't struggling with an unaffordable cost of care as we come out of this crisis. And if we don't take our opportunity to both save our child care system and then rebuild it to something better than it was, we are going to stymie our economic recovery and women especially are going to be left behind. So let's go to Lillian. I see that you, you're raising your hand. You have, you yeah, have your just, to add, just to jump on um, what Catherine was saying, I think the other thing people should know is happening is there's a push right now, and actually it's been going since the original negotiations on the first CARES Act to get $50 billion um, of direct assistance to child care. That, as you, if you're listening to her, $9.6 billion a month, that is not going to be sufficient to cover what needs to happen. Um, and also, so far, there's been no indication that that money is actually going to get there. So there was a letter that came out earlier this week. I think it was 29 Democratic senators, but there's not a single Republican senator signed on. I mean, as the journalist skeptic, I'm not actually seeing, there's been no real interest, it doesn't seem like, from leadership in, in making that a thing. Um, and what Patricia was saying earlier about the, the loans, like the writing was kind of on the wall for that. That was set up for, you know, small businesses, yes, but ones with like, um, a business office where there was an accountant who knew exactly how and when to get that loan application in right on the deadline. And mm -hmm. it was always gonna be hard for smaller businesses. Um, and I applaud you, Patricia, for getting through those applications, but it was always gonna be hard for the tiniest businesses to get through um, and get that money because it was first come first serve. So it was complicated from the beginning and unlikely to succeed. 
Well, at this point, let me turn it over. Let's see if uh, is Abby Lieberman is is she available to come on? Um, Abby is a colleague of mine at the at New America. She works in the early ed team, and this is a, this is one of the things that you you all have been looking into, uh, specifically looking at. Um, you know, the small business loans and how that's working with uh, uh, child care providers. Can you tell us what you're finding? Hi, Bridget. Yeah, thanks so much for letting me jump in. Um, I put it in the chat and I'll share it again. One of my colleagues wrote a blog a few weeks ago on the small business loans and, um, and basically just in line with what Lillian and Catherine have said, you know, they um, there, there weren't enough. The, a lot of the child providers weren't able to get to them. And mostly I'm curious to hear from the providers, um, again, kind of in line with what Lillian was just saying, what types of supports would be helpful um, from the, from state governments, from local governments that you're not seeing that um, that you'd like to see that you think could help you access these these resources better? So I'm sorry, Abby, was that a question that you had wanted to ask for Patricia? Yes, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from Patricia more about um, their experience or, and maybe not, maybe not in relation to just the loans, but, um, but in general, what kind of um, support from state or local or local government would you like to see that you think could help make a difference in this? Yeah, Patricia, so what, what do you think would really help? What do you need as a, as a provider, a family care provider? What do you need from the state? What do you need from the government? What do you need? moving forward in this pandemic and also beyond. Are you, are you asking me? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, so I was asking you, you yeah, for, for Patricia, so what do you need? Internet connection, something, something happened. I couldn't, I couldn't hear really the whole question. Can you so, repeat? Sure. So she, so Abby was asking, you know, for, for family care providers, what do you need? What do you need from the state government? What do you need from the federal government? What do you need to really get through this crisis and, and survive and thrive beyond that? Um, you know, the fir first of all, they need to hear our voice. They need to hear what our necessities, you know, they're not like, they need to, they need to support us. With the, in this crisis, we need to do you know cleaning supplies. We need to a lot of stuff like we can protect our our bakers, like the for the loans, you know, to prevent the other childcare providers they clean close their the bakers, the business. Because you know, it's one of the things I like to put in an emphasis is childcare family childcare providers. We have we open our daycares four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. In the morning, we take care of kids until midnight. Saturdays, Sundays, we are just our schedule to parents' schedule. Right. You know, we are the service is completely different. You know, are the other service and they bring the kids very early. And sometimes we we care children eleven, twelve hours a day. And yeah, they need to put attention how much money we are receiving, you know, right. they are paying us. It's so little right. for 10 or so, 12 hours. So you're putting in all of that time and you really need to make sure that it's, that you're, that you're being compensated and that the care that you're giving is actually valued and valuable. So let me turn it over to Rashonda so for some final thoughts, you know. So here you are, a, you know, dedicated uh, early care educator, actually thinking about leaving the field. Um, you know, uh, was that something that really became clear during this crisis? And, you know, this is a, this is again a system in quotation marks where there's so much turnover and that really does impact uh, children. But, uh, you know, uh, what do you think the system needs in the future to keep people like you in it? They need to be more supported to keep teachers um, understand that you know we are important too. You know we love what we do, but we also need. They also need to understand like we have children and family also. Because um, I know that I read a couple a month ago that the governor of New York was saying that you know daycares would just be open. Like we're just like it, we, were, we weren't that important enough where. Some daycares did open and took a hit, and some daycares are taking a hit even if they are open. So I just want people to say, like, you know, we do matter in early childhood too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. You know, I want to I want to thank everyone for 
I want to thank the panelists, Lillian, uh, Patricia, Rashonda, Catherine. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I want to thank all of the participants who have been on the chat and um, asking all sorts of great questions and sharing your stories. Uh, I want to thank the New America Events team and the Better Life Lab and my producer, David Shulman. You know, thank you so much for helping us get some clarity about where we are now with childcare and more importantly, you know, why it's broken and, and what we need to do in the future to fix it. So next week, uh, as we get closer to Mother's Day, we're going to, we're going to be exploring the pandemic and single parents, uh, many of the mothers. So I hope that you will all stay safe this week and that you will join us again next week for another crisis conversation live from the Better Life Lab. Thank you, everybody.